Good morning. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning for our um, online uh, video service from First Baptist Church in Hibbing. We're glad to have you uh, joining us, watching, and some of you may be watching um, first thing on Sunday morning, so maybe some other time, but we're glad whenever it is that you can um, join together with us as we look to the Lord and uh, worship Him and contemplate His Word. Before we get to our music and the message, um, just review a few announcements. There's not much new to add than what we had the last few weeks that um, we know we'll be online for at least one more week, and uh, I'm hopefully going to be talking with the uh, leaders in the church this week as far as what it looks beyond that, as far as um, if we're going to, how soon it will be uh, before we start trying to gather back again um, uh, here at the church. Part of it depends on uh, what's going on with the uh, governor's regulation, and part of it's just uh, our own ability to deal with some of these things. So. Um, we're glad that you can watch us, and so perhaps you're on Facebook, perhaps you're on uh, YouTube or our church website. Um, you can look up those other mediums uh, if you like, but uh, look for hibbingbaptist.org to the website. You can find information going on. Um, a little more up-to-date announcements might show up in our uh, Facebook page, which also, if you search for hibbingbaptist.org, it'll be there. And... Um, one thing that I, I would, would like to ask those of you who are watching, um, if you've got some input on maybe one of these platforms or another is not working as well. Um, I've had some people say, I have trouble on Facebook, but it's fine on the website or vice versa. It's not good on the website, but it's good on YouTube. Um, maybe some of you are using a phone, some a tablet, some uh, are doing it uh, over your TV using YouTube. Um, if you find something that works really well for you or something that works really poor, let me know because otherwise I really can't change any of the settings until I hear from you. So uh, all of my settings have kind of changed a little bit from week to week, except this week I'm using the same uh, format both on the, uh, the camera and on the computer and so on to upload these things. So uh, hopefully that will all work out consistently now. Um, for those who do not have internet, that uh, I can make the uh, service available over uh, by a DVD, and so we've been printing out a few copies of that and getting that to people. And so if you know someone who has not been able to view the service, but they don't have internet, please let me know, and uh, we'll try to get that uh, DVD available to them. Besides uh, these Sunday services, which are recorded, we've been having our Wednesday evening uh, prayer meeting service by uh, Zoom, and so that's been a great time of fellowship to be able to see one another face-to-face, um, to uh, share some prayer requests, and at the end of the service, we kind of just do open mic, allow people just to chit-chat back and forth, and so that's been great to connect with people that way. Um, for security reasons, we don't put that uh, link on our website or Facebook page. You need to receive a uh, personal invitation to that, and I've been sending that out by email, and so if you haven't received uh, an email with that link to Zoom, I send it out on Wednesday afternoon. If you haven't received that, please give me a call so that I have an accurate uh, email address and I can get that out to you. And then I try to take all those prayer requests that we received on Wednesday night and put them in a newsletter that I send out on Thursday. It goes out by email on Thursday uh, for those of you that I have email addresses for. Otherwise, I would send out a paper copy. And so if you don't get a paper copy, would like to, I could send it out to you, but it just helps save a little bit of money if I can send it out by email. Um, then just want to thank those of you who have been giving, um, uh, sending in offerings, whether you send it in by mail, whether you drop it off here at the church, you um, use the online uh, giving platform. We appreciate those of you who have uh, been participating in that. Uh, considering the disruption of uh, services here over these last few weeks, I wasn't sure how we were going to do through uh, the month, what, what our income is going to be. At this point, we're a little below budget, uh, but we're not that far away from our normal giving. And so um, let me just thank you for uh, being consistent in your uh, support here of the church, praying one for another. I've been hearing that some people have been sending out cards and making phone calls and so on to one another, uh, trying to keep in touch. And so uh, that's encouraging as a church for us to uh, not forget one another. And so if you or someone else you know could use some uh, personal assistance um, someone to do some shopping for them or um, some way to, to assist them uh, in a, a hands-on kind of way. Uh, if you could pass that along, I do have several people who have 
expressed willingness to uh, do some shopping, pick up some things, deliver them, what have you. So um, that's what's going on here at uh, the church, and uh, we trust that you'll stay in touch with us. So before we proceed further, let's uh, bow before the Lord in prayer. Our God and Father, as we come before you at this time, we're thankful that your spirit is still present, even if the congregation can't be in this room at this time, at least not the full congregation. Uh, we're thankful that we have your holy word available to us, that we can read and study it uh, for ourselves, that we can apply it to our lives. And so we're asking that even now, uh, wherever a viewer may be, that uh, you would quiet their hearts and minds to uh, put out those distractions so that they can uh, ponder uh, your truth through the music and through the message, that as they consider your truth, that their hearts can be stirred, strengthened, and uh, drawn to you. And so we pray that you be glorified in this service and everyone who has a part of it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What I've been doing here these um, several of the weeks of our services, I've been doing a uh, hymn story uh, in lieu of having uh, several congregational hymns. We have more limited amount of music, uh, but I thought it would be helpful to get a little background on uh, some of the music. And um, in just a little while, the, the Shea family is going to be sharing in uh, music for today's service. And one of the songs they're going to sing first is, I have decided to follow Jesus. And so I, I did a little research to find the uh, backstory on that hymn. And so let me uh, read some of this to you. It says, uh, this song actually stands as a monument to the international nature of the gospel as well as the radical call to suffer and to die with Jesus. The late 1800s saw an evangelistic explosion in India. Entire provinces formerly closed to the gospel uh, were swept up uh, a missionary movement perhaps unparalleled in history. Wales in particular sent hundreds of missionaries to northern India and they were joined by Indian evangelists as well as missionaries from England, Australia, and the United States. This movement was remarkable for two reasons. First, it was led mostly by Indians themselves and those men were national figures. Second, this missionary endeavor was focused on northern India which was firmly in the grips of the most oppressive forms of Hinduism. It was a place where the caste system was entrenched and where headhunters ruled. These provinces were uh, often prided themselves on their hostile reaction to foreigners. Dozens and dozens of missionaries were martyred, but despite the opposition and violence, or perhaps even because of it, the gospel made inroads into previously off-limits areas. Uh, in the 1880s, a Welsh missionary who had endured severe persecution finally saw his first converts uh, in a particularly brutal village in the Indian province of Assam. A husband and his wife and their two children professed faith in Christ and were baptized. Their village leaders decided to make an example out of the husband. And so arresting the family, they demanded that he renounce Christ or see his wife and children murdered. When he refused, the two children were executed. Uh, given another chance to recant, the man refused and his wife was similarly executed. Uh, still refusing to recant, the man followed his family into glory. Witnesses later told the story of the Welsh, uh, to the Welsh missionary. The report said that when he was asked to recant or to see his children murdered, the man said, I have decided to follow Jesus and there's no turning back. After seeing his children killed, the, he reportedly said, the world's behind me, the cross is still before me. After seeing his wife killed, he said, though no one is here to go with me, Still, I will follow Jesus. According to the missionary, when he returned to the village sometime later, a revival had broken out, and those who had murdered the first converse had since come to faith themselves. The Welsh man passed along these reports to a famous Indian evangelist named Sadhu Singh. Singh had risen to prominence in India because he was training foreign missionaries, and a theme of his teaching had been uh, to avoid some of the Western uh, traditions of Christianity and uh, limit their message to uh, the true gospel and the scriptures. And so there was now a thriving Indian Christian community uh, that was developing their own music and, cu and customs. The accounts of the family uh, that had been martyred in Assam were so astonishing and widely circulated that most Indian believers were familiar with it. So Singh took the martyr's last words and put them to traditional Indian music in order to make one of the first uniquely Indian hymns. The song immediately became popular in Indian churches and it remains a mainstay of worship music there to this day. 
Eventually, some of the American missionaries returned from India, and they brought, with, uh, they brought that song with them. Finally, it ended up with a Canadian songwriter by the name of George Beverly Shea, and uh, he made it a staple among the Billy Graham Crusades, and so many of us probably have heard it there. So at this time, we're going to have the uh, Shea family come, and they're going to, uh, the children are going to come, and they're going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Thank you very much. Appreciate you sharing that. And uh, I'm going to read a portion of scripture. And then after that, I'm going to have uh, the older two Shea girls come. And uh, they will have a, another special number for us. Uh, this morning, I am going to be looking at the nature of the church as presented in the New Testaments. And I'll talk more about that later. But as we're thinking about what is the church like, what does, uh, how does God work through the church, I'd like to read a passage of scripture I will allude to it in part of the message, but uh, this is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm going to read from verse 11 down through verse 27. It says, But all these worketh that one and selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they the members, yet uh, now are they many members, were, uh, where were, and if they were all one member, where were the body? Uh, but now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another." And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. At this time, we're going to have um, Alyssa and Hannah Shea come and share with us a uh, message and song.
girls, appreciate your sharing in the work of the ministry here today. We look to the Word of God today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 in a uh, few moments, but uh, uh, let me begin by mentioning a few other things, setting some background for it. Think back to when I first started into college. I uh, attended Northland Baptist Bible College when I was in the uh, early years of the college's existence. Uh, the campus originally had been a summer Bible camp, and so in those early years of college, uh, there was a lot of remodeling uh, going on in order to accommodate uh, the needs of the college. And so um, at the time, most of the student body worked on campus, and so uh, whether it was in kitchen, housekeeping, office, library, uh, what have you, there were a lot of us that worked in the maintenance department, and so besides doing uh, the upkeep of the buildings and grounds. Some of us were uh, occasionally brought into some construction projects. And so I remember at least one time being assigned to work with a crew that was doing some work on the um, original dormitory building. So in the early years of the camp, there's two long, narrow uh, buildings there in the center of campus between the dining hall and the chapel uh, where they, uh, that they use for girls' dorms and for married student dorms. At that time, they had flat roofs. And so uh, there were some roofing issues going on, I, I believe. And so um, what they decided was that uh, we need to build a peaked roof on there. And so we started those uh, projects. And so even though a number of us that were working maintenance had little to no experience with uh, construction, we got to be laborers and we hauled boards and did different things. And some of those that were more experienced that they could uh, have the more uh, accurate jobs, uh, uh, they need a little more experience. And, and uh, something I learned that uh, remains with me to this day um, came about on the day that we were cutting rafters that um, our maintenance director, he had been a former contractor, and so he had been up there and done all the measurements and figured out where they need to be notched and angles and all those sort of things. And so he had created a pattern, and um, some was supposed to cut exactly according to the pattern. And that went fine, so someone's cutting boards, uh, maybe a couple people, I don't recall now, uh, were cutting the rafters, and uh, others of us are hauling, hauling boards up to the roof and uh, moving them, helping, what have you. What we hadn't noticed along the way and uh, became apparent after a while is that the ridge line was not straight, that the roof was going crooked and trying to find out why. And what had happened was that a pattern had been made, but someone in their exuberance had carried the pattern up and he just used whatever uh, the person who was marking things out used whatever board was there uh, to mark it off. And if you've ever done any cutting with a pattern, you know, if you don't keep your pencil straight or if it gets dull, you gradually creep away from the line. And that's what had happened. And so by the time the person just kept using whichever board was there to make the next one, that dimension kept changing. And so pretty soon uh, it wasn't accurate. And uh, um, we had some problems that had to be taken apart and redone through a portion of that roof. But the lesson that we learned at that time is that if you want to have an accurate building, you've got to stay according to the blueprint. You've got, you've got to stay focused and make the dimensions exactly uh, the way the, uh, the designer intended. And so I mentioned all of this to you uh, this morning in, intro in introducing this message. Um, to point out the same principle is true with regards to the New Testament church. If we are to build what God intended as a church, then we must stick to his building pattern, that we have to stick to his plan, his pattern. We cannot be indifferent or haphazard or say, well, if we're a little bit off, it doesn't really matter because all those little deviations will uh, accumulate over time and create something that is a vast departure uh, from God, what God intends his church to be. And so we, need not, uh, we, we must not uh, become ensnared in man-made methods and uh, traditions for what it means to build and grow a church if it's to be God's church. We must do God's work God's way. And so uh, this morning and over these last uh, few weeks, I've been doing some uh, thinking because uh, with all that's going on with regard to this coronavirus, uh, there are a lot of articles that are floating around. And I'm talking about in Christian circles and even on pastors and uh, church experts, uh, supposedly, and so on. Uh, 
where people are, are saying, well, maybe this is going to change and that's going to change. Of course, it's all speculation that we don't know how is this all going to pan out. We live in this time of, of uncertainty about how we, we, we operate as a church. And some are giving thought and attention to the fact, going so far as to say, the church as we knew it will no longer exist. That we're going to be much more of online. There's going to be very limited uh, local churches. Uh, people aren't going to participate. We're, we're going to have to change the way we do things. Well, admittedly, um, some things may change. But we must be careful about what we change and what we do not allow to change. And so, as I mentioned uh, last week, that there are some blessings to uh, doing online ministry, having video available to people who are, are homesick, shut in, elderly, people who aren't able to get out. But I think what can happen for those who don't really have limitations is that it can create in us a sense of laziness or indifference towards what a God expects a local church to be. And so last week I mentioned some possible problems that I think could erupt after an extended period of time in which uh, church is being done uh, simply through uh, online uh, media. I think it can produce a lack of commitment where people say, you know, I don't really want to get up that early. I don't really want to get dressed. I just want to kind of take it easy. Uh, I like having my whole Sunday all to myself at, uh, at home, and I think it can produce a, a lack of commitment that I don't sure pe I want to go back to church anymore when this is over. We need to be aware of that. I think another problem is uh, that comes about through um, extended time of online ministry might be a lack of fellowship, that we uh, fail to realize how important it is that we actually talk to other Christians, that we see their life, see their faith, see how they respond, that, that the Christian faith is more than words on a page. We see it being lived out in, in real life, and we need that fellowship and encouragement of being with other people. A third thing that I noted last week, besides a uh, uh, lack of commitment, lack of fellowship that uh, could come about out of an extended period of time of online ministry, is a lack of service. That um, people may begin to sense that, you know, the church really doesn't need me. I don't need to be a teacher anymore. I don't need to be uh, on the board anymore. I don't need to do this anymore. It's like, you know, why is that even important? Um, that we can come to the point where we, we fail to see that we have a role, according to God's pattern, to actually serve and to be engaged, to participate uh, in a local church. That what, what grows out of all this, I think, is, is that we become spectators. We become accustomed to being a spectator rather than a participant in the local church. And so all of this really can come about uh, as I was thinking about why could some of these things develop and what I'm reading and speculation and so on is it really all comes down to, I think the common denominator is that um, these things can arise if we lose our biblical foundation. If our choices and our decisions with regard to what constitutes a church and how we function, function as a church is purely a matter of how do I feel, what's convenient, uh, then we can certainly go far astray of God's pattern. We can shift away from a biblical foundation. And so we need to be careful that in um, our present experience where we have suddenly been thrust into the, the necessity of saying, well, I've got to come up with an online ministry and I've got to develop a website. All these, we do it real quick and we start acting simply uh, impetuously that we uh, don't allow pragmatism, that pragmatism is that philosophy, if, if it works, do it. Um, where we right and wrong become somewhat relative, uh, we just want to figure out, however I can get the best results, I'll just do whatever I got to do. We need to be careful that we don't allow uh, results and feeling to become the, the uh, foundation for ministry. And so, you know, as we just think about all this, that none of us have ever experienced um, such a sudden and total shutdown of life as we know it. Uh, even people that I've talked to who lived during, uh, you know, the Second World War and the Depression had uh, monumental impacts on the way people were living. Uh, but even some who've lived during the Depression and Second World War was, it wasn't like this, where suddenly, even the way you think about, do I go to the store? Do I see a person? Um, what are, that we've just seen the economy uh, shut down. We've seen so many things happening that I never would have imagined that uh, you even think about 
what you're going to do when you go to the store. Need groceries? Go. And now it's like, okay, now where do I go? When do I go? When's the best time to go? Do I have the right, you know, mask or gloves or whatever? And, and all these sort of things. Are there going to be open or are there going to be uh, uh, items on, on the shelves and whatnot? You know, if we're not careful, we can allow our lives to become dictated by fear rather than truth. Is there change? Yes. Will there be change for uh, weeks, months, years to come? I think so. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean all of it is bad. I think that there can be some good things that, that can come about it. But we have to still continue to adapt and evaluate ourselves to say, if I am changing, am I changing in areas that are essential? And for us as a church, are we changing things that are of biblical significance? There may be some things that we've done out of habit, tradition, what have you as a church. We say, you know, some things may need to adjust a little bit. Um, so be it. But let us never depart from the biblical pattern, foundation, God's blueprint for what the church is supposed to be. And so in recent weeks, I've been addressing uh, initially some things such as God's comfort, God's care, God's strength uh, in the midst of trials because that's where we're at. But I'm also thinking here in the last few weeks uh, that I need to go beyond simply talking about God's strength and care to bring us back to a foundation point where we can say, I need to know God loves and God cares even in the midst of troubles, but as I move forward, do I have the right focus? Do I have the right foundation? I'm living in a changing world, but what are uh, essential to me? And so last week I talked about having a biblical foundation. That's first and foremost. Today I want to look at uh, what is a biblical church. So that's what I've kind of entitled my message. Uh, but kind of exploring what does the New Testament say about the New Testament church. And so I'll be looking at a few different uh, passages. Uh, I did a scripture reading earlier from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, for a little while here, I'm going to be looking in Acts chapter 2. But I'd like us to just to consider in kind of a topical fashion, what is a church according to God's blueprint here in the New Testament? And let me start off by saying that giving a definition of the church, and then we're going to go to the origin of the church, and then thirdly, I'll go to the activity of the church. And as we think about the definition of the church, the word which is translated, uh, the Greek word in the original manuscripts, which is translated as church into our, our English uh, Bibles, is the word ekklesia. Um, and it's uh, a word which literally means an assembly, an assembly of people, a group of people. And so in the Greek of uh, the, the day, the time of the New Testament, it was, did not have a strictly spiritual reference, religious reference. Uh, it could be any group of people. In fact, uh, you would find it used in a secular sense in Acts chapter 19, uh, where the, uh, there was an uproar, there was a riot in Ephesus, and that uh, Paul had been dragged out to the ecclesia. Well, it wasn't a church, uh, but it was an assembly of people who gathered together uh, to um, respond, react to the preaching of the Apostle Paul there in their city. Um, oftentimes, uh, in fact, most of the time in the Bible, in the New Testament, uh, the word ecclesia always has reference to the assembly of the people of God. So while it can have a secular reference, originally had a secular reference, this word, particularly in Christian usage, in Bible usage, is primarily referring to the assembly of the people of God, a gathering together of God's people. The first place that we find the word church used in the New Testament um, is actually uh, the words of Jesus Christ in uh, Matthew chapter 16 and uh, verse 18, a passage that probably uh, most of us are familiar with. And this is where um, Jesus um, was talking to his disciples, and so he said, he asked them, um, who do men say that I am? This would be in Matthew 16 beginning at verse 13. And they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, and one, and, or one of the prophets. And he, this is Jesus, Jesus, saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
Well, if we, we stop there for uh, just a moment to see um, what does he mean by uh, I will build my church. First, we just keep in mind that he says, I will build my church, that the church was yet future. Um, but when you look at this passage of scripture, that um, some Roman Catholics in particular would say, see, this verse proves that Peter was the first pope because he says that he is the uh, foundation upon which the church will be built. built. And I think that is a uh, misuse of the original language. There's, there's an overlap there. We have a play of words, but they're not synonymous. Um, in Greek, um, Peter comes from Petra, um, and uh, that means a rock. And it can refer to kind of an individual rock, a pebble, a boulder, uh, but it's an individual rock, or rather Petras is Peter's name, uh, but Petra uh, refers to bedrock. And if any of you have seen pictures over in the um, Holy Land trips, they'll take you to Petra. It's a city that's built into bedrock. It's solid rock. And so you have a foundation rock where you don't really find the edges. Uh, and then Petras is an individual uh, rock. It doesn't specify the size. But when we think about that, you, Peter, are a boulder, if we will, but upon this Petra, this bedrock, I'm going to build my church. So it's not saying I'm going to build it on Peter. I'm going to build it on something else. What is something else? I believe it's the declaration that Peter made here. It's not that I'm building the church on Peter. I'm building on, on what you just said. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here is the foundation of the New Testament church. And so the first usage of the word church in the New Testament uh, is given by Jesus Christ, but it's not really uh, find that being expanded. We don't find a description of the church until we get to the uh, second chapter of Acts. But just to back up a bit, the word ecclesia means a gathering of people together. And in particular, it would be, therefore, a gathering of people together who profess that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And as we uh, would work our way through the New Testament, and we don't have time to work our way through the whole New Testament uh, to see uses of the church, we find that it, it can be used in a couple of different ways. On a few occasions, uh, it refers to all believers who have uh, come to know Jesus Christ as their, their Savior. So uh, it will be referred to as the body of Christ, which is his church. And so we, uh, some would use the word uh, universal church um, to use this to describe all believers from the time the church began until Christ returns. That is, is one church. And so there's a sense that that, that is true. Um, it exists. Uh, but that's not the primary usage in the New Testament. The primary usage in the New Testament is not just a group of individuals as a part out of all humanity, uh, the universal church being a group of individuals who are the followers of Jesus Christ. The most uh, uh, common uh, use throughout the New Testament is referred to a local gathering together, a local assembly of believers who uh, are particular followers of Jesus Christ. And so uh, we need to understand this as we go to the scriptures and look to the Bible that when we say church, we can't uh, 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 read into it uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years of tradition say, well, they're referring to the Baptist church, the Methodist church, the Lutheran church, the Catholic church. Those are all secular usages that have developed. In the New Testament, it's talking about a individual group of people who are gathered together under a common faith in Jesus Christ. And I draw your attention now to Acts chapter 2, in particular, um, picking up at verse 37 and uh, reading down through the end of the chapter. And we find that this is, uh, this is written on the, uh, is describing for us what took place on the day of Pentecost. And so if you recall, Jesus was crucified at the time of Passover. <clears throat> we find that 40 days later is when he ascended. Uh, Pentecost, Penta 5, is 50 days after the Passover. This would be a time when um, the Jewish people would gather together uh, for a harvest uh, festival. So kind of the springtime harvest uh, festival, uh, winter wheat and so on, that would have been uh, brought in probably by this point in time. But they were gathered together in Jerusalem. So the day of Pentecost is part of Jewish uh, history and culture um, and religion that Jews were gathered there. But on this day that uh, God or Christ had promised that he was going to send his spirit, he told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. And so they were waiting there. They didn't spread uh, back to their homes in, in Galilee, where most of them are from. They remained in Jerusalem. And now on this day, we find that um, 
God's spirit came upon them in a uh, new and special way. They were able to speak in tongues and languages which they had never known. And so this was very functional because we have people, Jews from around the, um, the Mediter Mediterranean area that had come to Jerusalem for this worship. So they spoke in various languages and such. And so the disciples went out and they began to preach and to teach and to speak of Christ in languages they had never learned, but languages that were clearly understandable by the people who were there. And so these were not uh, mystery languages. They were real languages that people spoke. And everyone realized that this was an, a miracle. How was this even possible? And so Peter uh, used this occasion under the direction of God to preach a message of the gospel. And I'm not reading that this morning for the sake of time, but from verse 14 um, all the way down through uh, verse 36, we find Peter's sermon uh, to the Jews who had gathered there and were hearing about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the crucified and resurrected Son of God. Now, I pick up then in verse 37, which says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And they that gladly received his word and were baptized, the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the church. And the Lord added unto the uh, church uh, daily such as should be saved. And so as we look here and see the origin of the church, uh, we find uh, the description, first of all, uh, how was this church being formed? What was it that made this a unique assembly distinct from all the other Jews who had gathered into Jerusalem at this time? We see that this, this assembly uh, was distinctive. A specific group of people was marked, first of all, by their repentance and salvation. They recognized that they were sinners, that they were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died in their place, was paying their sin. And so they recognized they were sinners in need of salvation, and they placed their faith in him. And so we find that there was repentance, salvation that took place. It was followed by baptism that they who repented were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So this was a unique baptism up to this point in time, uh, and I really don't have time to, to go too far afield there, uh, but as far as the, the baptism of John the Baptist was not a baptism uh, to be followers of Jesus. It was a baptism that recognized a repentant attitude towards sin. Now they're being baptized, water immersed specifically as a means of identifying with Jesus Christ himself and the forgiveness of sin which he provides. So we find that there's salvation, there's baptism, and there's spirit baptism. They receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a distinctive mark of the New Testament church that sets it apart from Old Testament Israel. It sets it apart really from the disciples in the time uh, of Jesus Christ because now there's something new that has begun here uh, at the day of Pentecost. That now when a person put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they identified as followers of Christ and were baptized. We find that it was at their salvation now that the Holy Spirit uh, came upon them, uh, dwelt within them. So while Jesus Christ, the, per the presence of God, was uh, physically absent from them, now they have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. And the being to be spirit baptized means to be made a part of the body of Christ. We would find that described for us more in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, which I read earlier. It says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And the word baptized means to be uh, dumped, to be placed into. 
And so they, by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, all believers now become a part of one common body, the body of Christ. So we talk about the universal church, and if you don't like that term, the body of Christ, uh, that we are placed into a large body. But that larger body is comprised of all the individual local churches. And so we just need to keep in mind that spirit baptism began at Pentecost. And therefore, that is what began the church age. That's what began the body of Christ. That begins the first local uh, church of uh, baptized believers who are united uh, strictly uh, re re regarding their faith in Jesus Christ. And so this is showing us the, the formation of the first church. We'd also notice, as I read here in Acts chapter 2, regarding the function of this first church. We find it is characterized by them uh, worshiping. That uh, when you get down to... Um, I'm losing my, my place here. Um, yeah, but uh, down to verse 46, that they were continuing daily with one accord in the temple. So we find that they're gathered together for worship. We find that they're gathered together for um, instruction. Um, that uh, verse 42 says they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. So they went to the temple to worship. But in particular, what are they learning about? Are they still following all the, the Old Testament rituals saying nothing has changed? No, what they're being taught by the apostles as uh, specially gifted and able messengers of God to teach them the ways of Christ. And so they continued to worship God. They were now being instructed with regard to Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what Jesus told the disciples that they were supposed to do. The Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, uh, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so the idea is make disciples of all nations. And how are you going to do that? By, by the uh, ongoing teaching and instruction. And so this early church, they have now gathered. Uh, they are now worshiping as they were. They're being instructed in the things of Christ as he had commanded. They're involved in fellowship. Um, and so it says that they're holding things common. They're fellowshipping there. Verse 42 says they st remain steadfast in doctrine and in fellowship. Now, in, in our churches, a lot of Baptist churches and a lot of other churches, when we talk about fellowship, we always equate that with a meal, that we have a fellowship dinner, that we come together or we're standing around talking, and that's fellowship. Well, that's true. I think that's part of fellowship, but that's not the full uh, effect of fellowship. Fellowship really means, uh, really uh, refers to a sharing what is in common, and we find that it involves a loving relationship that makes you want to share, uh, and so that uh, here in these early days, particularly when they're being ostracized out of Judaism, that uh, they're literally sharing all their financial resources to care for one another. Remember that you have all of these uh, pilgrims who have come from various areas of the world in Judaism to come and worship, and now they're staying together. They don't have jobs. They need support, and so people are selling their goods, and they're helping uh, support one another, and so they're eating together, and they're sharing their resources with one another. You see, this was a body of people. This is not just a bunch of spectators who said, I can just watch this church from afar. I can listen and go my way. They come and say, I've got a common faith. I am worshiping the same one true God. I am in being instructed in what Jesus Christ said. I am fellowshipping. I am participating with one another. Uh, there is the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, in the course of this, it said they went from house to house uh, eating their meat. And so some would look at this and say, well, is the breaking of, of bread uh, in particular referring to uh, they're just sharing food with one another? Well, it can be. But I think in the, in the context of verse 42 in particular, uh, because they're being steadfast in doctrine and in fellowship, breaking bread and prayers, I think this may be that they're continuing to do what Christ prescribed for them to do there in the Last Supper. He says, this do in remembrance of me, that they are continuing to meet and observe uh, the ordinances that Christ had prescribed. And so these are, are, this is descriptive of what the first church was in the New Testament. And so if we were to go beyond this then and see what else do we find about the nature of the church in the New Testament, uh, that would take a long time for me to rehearse a lot of passages of Scripture. So uh, let me just summarize a number of things. And uh, again, just to remind you why I'm looking at this is, as far as the New Testament teaching regarding the church 
is that we must never come to a place where we say, I think we need to re redefine the church to be people who believe in Christ and spectate from afar. That we become followers of Christ. Christ's teachings are going to transform our lives. We are going to interact with the world and share the gospel, yes, but we're also interacting and fellowshipping with God's people, both in worship and in instruction and in fellowship and in the ordinances, that we have to gather together to do that. That's why we are an assembly, an ecclesia, a gathering together. And so uh, just to summarize some of these things is that um, the... Uh, a New Testament church, as we, if we would survey uh, much of the New Testament, we find that after the book of Acts, when you go through the New Testament, when you uh, see a church referred to in uh, the epistles, whether it's Pauline epistles um, or what have you, uh, you would find uh, that churches are descri described, uh, the word church is used to describe a specific group of individuals in a specific location, followers of Jesus Christ. And so you can go, and whether you look in the epistles, the book of Acts, go to the uh, book of Revelation, particularly the, the uh, second the third chapter we find the, the letters to the seven churches and you find that there was a church in Jerusalem and in Antioch and to Ephesus and Corinth and Galatia and Philippi, uh, Philippi and Colossae and Berea, Thessalonica, Smyrna, Smyrna uh, Pergamos, Thyatira, uh, so on and so forth, Rome, that there are individual churches and individual locations, bodies of people, groups of people who were assembling together to worship. And so we need to keep in mind that when we come to New Testament, it describes people the church is an assembly, a gathering together that uh, people may talk today about, well, it's the internet church. It's the digital church. There's people who don't want to come and be a part of a local congregation. Uh, they want to become a spectator from afar. Well, I'm not saying that they're not um, believers. I don't know that. Only God can look at their heart. But that is not a church. That is not an assembly of people who have gathered together uh, for mutual uh, faith and service. And so we find the churches were gathered. They were taught. And so throughout the New Testament epistles, um, we are frequently uh, being shown that we need to uh, teach sound doctrine, that we must oppose false doctrine, that we need to be taught over and over again what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. What does scripture say? And so people are gathering together. People are being instructed. Their members are to be witnesses that as they are saved, they're being taught God's word, uh, that they're to carry this uh, to the four corners of the world, to share their faith with others, and those too will grow in their faith and be discipled. Uh, and as we move beyond just the gathering and the teaching and the witnessing, they are serving. That a true church will have uh, gathered members, taught members, witnessing members, serving members. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 11 through 16, and this is just one passage out of, out of several that talk about the necessity of the individual people within a church to be using gifts. I read earlier from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it emphasized the fact that the Holy Spirit gifts uh, the individual members differently. Uh, the Holy Spirit gives them individually, severally, as he will. So he is the one that gives the gifts so that you have eyes and ears and so on. So he's using the, the analogy of the human body. And so while we are one person, I've got eyes that are doing one thing and ears are doing something else and a stomach that's doing something else, feet that do something else. And so it is within the body of Christ. People have variety of abilities, but all of those need to come together for us to function as a whole. It's hard for us to imagine that if we just had an eyeball rolling along, if we just had an ear sitting over here, there's just a foot that's walking around and nothing else attached and saying, you know, the analogy that, that, uh, that Paul uses there in 1 Corinthians 12 is, if we are not serving together, then we believe in a dissected church where there's just individual body parts doing their own thing, all in their separate, where we are not to be dissected, we're to be gathered together to minister to one another. And here in Ephesians chapter 4, um, uh, it says, and he gave some, this is God, Christ, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, 
for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. For from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And so again, the Apostle Paul is emphasizing is that there is a distinction, there's differences of gifts and abilities uh, within the body of Christ, within the local church, but all of those are together uh, designed to draw us together as a group. And so I mention all these things to point out that the New Testament church is not a theoretical group of people that exists someplace out there in cyberspace where everyone's doing their own thing their own way, but that we're called to gather together. And so while I think that um, a local church, um, may, their individual believers may at time in a local church uh, as well may find a time such as we're at now where um, for um, certain reasons that we cannot meet in uh, one and one uh, circumstances, that is never to be our ultimate goal. That should never be our goal to say, well, we're just dispensing of our building, we're dispensing of our, you know, I'm just going to have an office, I'll preach everything, you know, out over the internet, and that's, that's good enough. That's not the New Testament church. That defies the very purpose of God's plan, that defies his blueprint. And so we find that a local church, if we're going to be in harmony with the New Testament, is comprised, uh, a, a true church is comprised of people who are genuinely born again. They identify with Christ through baptism by immersion after they believe. That's the only thing, only form of baptism you find throughout the New Testament. Next week, I'm going to talk about the ordinances of the church, and so we'll talk about baptism and communion at that time. Um, but I'm just throwing it out there here to begin with. But born-again people who follow Christ, and when they follow in Christ, they gather together, they're instructed in the word. They're prepared for service. And so here where it says that the, these apostles and uh, uh, prophets and so on, that what they're doing is that they are um, uh, perfecting the saints for the work of the ministry. It's not that the, the leaders are doing all the work of the ministry. It's that the, all the individual members are being trained to do ministry work. And so no one can say, well, you don't need me. I can be a spectator. Some of you can serve and some of you can be spectators. The New Testament knows of no one who is to be a spectator in the church. That everyone is to be a participant, a servant of God, and a servant and a ministry to others in the church. And so while I don't think it's sinful or disobedient to God if uh, we abstain from gathering together for a limited amount of time due to health, if that was the case, then someone would be sinning every time they got sick. Because, oh, they didn't show up at church. So I think it's possible for us to be sick or there's health concerns that keep us apart for time. But that can never replace the fact that, according to the New Testament, it is a gathered group of people who share the common faith, who serve one another as they worship the Lord. And so I am just um, challenging you as you are sitting perhaps in the comfort of your own uh, home and uh, sitting there perhaps in your comfortable clothes and saying, you know, I'm glad I don't have to go out today and I, I can just sit here and there's, there's no muss, no fuss, life is easy. Don't feel that that is a suitable substitute for the gathering together of God's people for mutual service and mutual worship. Let me challenge you as we conclude our service here um, today by recognizing if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you, even though you may be a part of an organized congregation, that does, make, does not make you part of the body of Christ, the true church. You need to be, have your faith and trust in Christ alone. Secondly, besides being born again, Recognize that you are a sinner, that Christ alone saves, and you must be wholly dependent on him and not relying upon your organizational church, 
your church rituals or anything else. You're trusting in Christ alone, but that if you've been obedient to him, you will want to gather together. You will want to identify yourself in a public fashion. That's what believer's baptism is, is making a public identification. I will follow Christ. The song that the girls sang earlier today or the children sang a little bit earlier today as far as I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, that we need to have that commitment to say, I will publicly pronounce my faith in front of, of everyone that I am a follower of Christ. We need to have that, that uh, testimony that we will walk with him. And so in doing so then, I gather together with God's people where I will faithfully contribute and participate in whatever fashion, or whether that's uh, economically, you know, I provide financial uh, support to the church, I am praying for the church, I'm praying for individuals, I'm also willing to uh, volunteer and to serve and be a part of things. That's what a church is all about. And so we may live in some uncertain times where things are, are uh, changing and people are, are evaluating. So what does church look like in the future? I think church in the future will look like this in the past. Some of the extraneous things may change, but it can never be a lack of a physical gathering of God's people together, of born-again people who keep his ordinances and serve God and worship him together. What happened at the beginning uh, of the New Testament church, what happens throughout the New Testament church must still be true today. We are not a true church unless we are a New Testament church. Our God and Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts as we have considered your word today, uh, that we would understand the Bible, that we would understand uh, through your Holy Spirit how we are to apply this truth to our lives. And I pray if there's someone who is uh, listening in even uh, this time, that uh, they would understand exactly their need of salvation, that need to have a faith in Christ alone and not in some organization, that they need to be followers of you, be willing to uh, admit it in a public fashion and be obedient even as your word prescribes. And so may we be earnest followers of you who willingly uh, serve you to the best of our ability as you've enabled us by your Holy Spirit. And so we pray that we'd be strengthened as a congregation, even this time that we may be uh, temporarily isolated, but that we gather back together with uh, great joy and affection to serve you and to, to minister to one another. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, before we close, just want to remind you as far as uh, check out the uh, website and Facebook pages for more information about what's going on in the church. And if you can provide us with a little bit of feedback about how uh, these online services, the, the technology is working for you, uh, that'll be helpful. Uh, we trust that you can join us on Wednesday evening for our prayer meeting service through Zoom. Again, if you haven't received the email uh, for that, please contact me about it. Uh, make sure I know about your prayer requests so I can share them with others in the congregation. And so um, we thank you for those of you who are sending in your financial support and uh, praying for one another as well. And so we trust that uh, you will be blessed by the Lord as you faithfully serve him. Thank you for joining us.